All right, so we have get a mount. Uh, about two more minutes. Mm -hmm. In the last minute, chat. Um, okay. Okay. Four oh five. Check my email. Great. All right, wonderful. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, David, are you um, recording? We are recording. Okay. 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 Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's board board meeting being conducted by WebEx via conference call platform. I'm your presiding officer for this afternoon, Saran Purcell, Director of External Board and Executive Assistant to Deputy Board President. Today we have three items on the agenda. Please note that this is a virtual here, this is a virtual um, programming and is being recorded to comply with public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing at Board President Adam One Brooklyn YouTube page. Um, it, viewers can also attend via the link, which is posted on the Board President's website as well. Um, in the interest of time, as stated before, um, we are going to uh, probably go to our first presenters, um, then break, do road call, and then bring in our last presenters. Um, Join us this evening from the office of the Board President is David Perez, who is handling tech support. Um, we are also joined um, by Hercule Reeves, um, and let me see, and I believe Michelle Crutchfield uh, too as well. So with that being said, we'd like to uh, give the floor to our first uh, presentation, um, which would be uh, from the New York State Attorney General Office. Um, they're going to be presenting uh, on protecting our community programming. The second presentation after that will be from the Mayor's Office. They're going to do a briefing on police reform and what? Oh, reinvention collaborative. So with that being said, I'd like to give the floor and call the representative from the State Attorney General Office, Letitia James. He's present. Hi, Michael. So please welcome Michael Barbosa, Assistant Attorney General in charge of Brooklyn Queens Regional Office. Um, just please set your name, title for the record, and you can begin your presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Purcell, and thank you, uh, distinguished members. My name is Michael, again, Barbosa. I'm the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Brooklyn Regional Office. Um, it's an honor to, to speak here on behalf of our wonderful Attorney General, Letitia James. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. And... All right, so uh, so yeah, I'm here again. Um, it's been, it's an honor to talk uh, about the Brooklyn Regional Office and the different types of initiatives that we are doing, um, working every day uh, to protect our community. And we uh, have these events called Protecting Our Community Initiatives, uh, which initially began because um, 
as, as the Brooklyn Regional Office, we not only represent the Kings County, but we also represent Queens County and there's no uh, physical office. And so we basically used to do uh, these pop-up um, legal issue meetings um, at different community groups within Queens. But in light of COVID, uh, we have been initiating these protecting our community virtual uh, meetings. Um, and just again, you know, um, our attorney general is, she's always been the people's lawyer, but she's definitely the people's lawyer on behalf of the entire state of New York. Uh, and my office uh, is one of 13 uh, regional offices throughout the state. Uh, and we protect civil and consumer rights. We defend labor laws, the environment, investors. Um, and, you know, we hear about all of the different initiatives in the news, uh, but the Brooklyn Regional Office is, is also, and all of the different bureaus are working every day about some of the not as popular issues uh, that we hear about, but uh, we also are very interested uh, we also prosecute violations of uh, state law and defend the state as well. Um, our authority comes from Executive Law 6312, and basically it authorizes our office to investigate and prosecute repeated fraud and illegal acts in the carrying on and conducting of business. And it's very broad. Uh, we can enforce not, not only state uh, or New York City violations, but also federal uh, violations as well. It gives us subpoena power uh, to obtain documents and testimony under oath, and we conduct a number of confidential investigations and we file uh, summary proceedings and lawsuits as well. We have limited uh, criminal authority, uh, but we work very closely with the district attorney's offices throughout the state, uh, in particular in Brooklyn, uh, DA Gonzalez, we work very closely. We just had um, a gun buyback event um, this past Saturday. Uh, and we also receive referrals um, under 6312. Uh, you know, um, the, the 6312 executive law power is our power to investigate um, police killings of unarmed civilians, um, the recent uh, nursing home investigation as well. Um, and, you know, basically I just wanted to give that layout because it's always important to see what the difference between the attorney general's office, our role is in the district attorney's uh, are the way that we seek uh, settlements is through mostly consent orders um, and to obtain restitution on behalf of consumers uh, and, and achieve penalties and criminal convictions as well. So I just wanted to point out our website, uh, which has a wealth of information uh, for your constituents, www.ag.ny.gov. And it's constantly being updated, especially in light of 2020, um, and we normally always do uh, smart senior presentations. Our community outreach liaison, Daryl White is on, and he organizes and, and presents on smart senior issues, internet safety, uh, our deed fraud uh, presentations. We did our deed fraud initiative last year, um, and we've spoken many times with the uh, Brooklyn Borough President about these issues. Um, and so, uh, Talking more about our protecting our community, these virtual appointments, here's our phone number, 718-560-2040. Uh, uh, our next upcoming ones is next Tuesday, February 9th, between 9 and 1, and then uh, in two, two weeks after that, February 23rd, between 9 and 1. Now, just mind you, you can always call, the community can always call uh, our number, and we're open 9 to 5, although we're not there physically, um, you know, accepting walk-ins. This is the reason why we've also included these virtual appointments where you can get one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations and appointments with uh, representatives and attorneys to talk about some of the issues. And then I just threw in a few of the issues that we've been hearing and complaints that we've been investigating involving COVID-19 scams, stimulus check scams, uh, COVID-19 vaccination fraud, there's just an article in the New York Times and, and many complaints about just the inequitable um, way that individuals are receiving uh, vaccines, um, you know, in terms of how the percentage of white Americans and white New Yorkers uh, and uh, New Yorkers of color, in, in particular in these communities. And we are very, um, of course, concerned about any type of inequity. And then just the usual scams that always work and are most vulnerable targeting our elderly. 
uh, dealing with identity theft and credit and debit card theft. Um, and in light of the new um, administration, um, you know, there's, there's, there's always a, a increase in immigration fraud. Uh, you know, oh, we have a new president and, you know, it's easy now for us to be uh, come a citizen and, you know, this organization or I can help you, uh, you know, expedite your application. But remember, it's always, if it's too good to be true, it's always too good to be true. And we need to continue to communicate that uh, because there is a process and there hasn't been a new law that, 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 that is in place uh, at this time. And of course, just housing and employment rights as well. Um, now, in terms of, you know, some of our publications, we also uh, have different publications. So, um, I don't know what just happened to my screen. Oh, there we go. Apologize. So, uh, this is our smart senior publication uh, that I discussed. And then just the statistics one in 25 nationally, we received one complaint out of 25 uh, cases of elderly abuse. Uh, I believe those numbers are way higher in, in Kings County. Uh, so, we do these community outreach presentations. Um, to get the word out that we want to hear from as many uh, issues or complaints as possible. Sometimes uh, our office may not be able to help, but we also conduct investigations that take years. And you might not know that we're working on it, but we are. Remember, these are confidential investigations that we're engaging in as well. Um, and then it's just the usual scams that still work. You know, the sweepstakes uh, scams, the fake check scams, the grandparent scams, you know, someone calling, feigning uh, that they're a, a grandchild and they need help. Uh, and then in these publications, there's the different websites that you can protect yourself, you know, a national uh, do not call registry, uh, credit card uh, opt out option, especially in light of just our uh, reliance on the internet. So internet safety is very important. And just reiterate how to protect your identity in terms of your birth dates, license, social security, maiden name, all of those different types of things that are important. Um, and these presentations, we talk about ways to, um, you know, shred important information, um, get access to a credit report. Uh, so these are what these virtual one-on-one uh, -on -one appointments can help and our, 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 our hotline as well. Uh, we have different type of relationships with a number of different type of um, legal service agencies that provide direct representation because, again, we don't provide direct representation. We examine uh, issues on behalf of the people of the state of New York uh, where there's a pattern of practice of fraud or illegality on um, not just one individual but entire um, community. Um, and so if a person's identity is stolen, there's also information. Um, that we can help you in terms of, you know, how to report it, what do you need to do, um, how to connect with the Federal Trade Commission and, and do an identity theft report. Um, also in light of COVID-19, um, you know, just reiterating what um, tenants' rights are uh, in terms of what the eviction moratorium now means. There's been so many different um, misinformation and there's the change in the law um, and the updating of the law and what constitutes illegal eviction or tenant harassment. These are issues that um, the Attorney General is very interested in, um, and we want to hear uh, of any type of patterns or practice of abuse that is going on. And as I talked about with immigration fraud, uh, service provider fraud, uh, there's just different tips, you know, um, and misrepresentations, unauthorized practice of law, people saying that they're um, notarios, but they're not lawyers, um, you know, in different types of uh, guarantees or uh, payments in advance. Uh, and, you know, so I'm just going to continue to go through this uh, and then reiterate deed theft fraud. You know, what does it mean? I mean, although, you know, there's a eviction moratorium, there's a foreclosure uh, moratorium on certain cases as well, um, widespread fraud continues. You know, um, people still can sign over titles or certain information could be forged or filed. Um, in the registry. So it's important for us to uh, continue to hear about these types of issues. And so we are, you know, continue to investigate and, and litigate these issues. Um, 
you know, some of the different types of examples, of course, is the short shell scams, loan modifications, uh, foreclosure bailouts, and um, uh, partition scams, individuals who die without um, wills. And, you know, there are disagreements in the family, and then there's these companies that are buying, quote unquote, interest and then suing individuals. We're very, very interested in these types of cases. Um, and then source of income. I mean, there's been such an increase in homelessness um, and people who are living in shelters that need permanent housing. Uh, and so any type of source of income discrimination, a pattern of cases involving landlords or, you know, even brokers, we want to hear about these types of issues. And these are different examples. Um, and then, of course, I mean, uh, our communities are so generous. So it's important to know what the rules are for charitable giving. Uh, and individuals that are contacting you, you know, know the charity, uh, the attorney general's office regulates all charities and they have to be registered with the state. Uh, this is our website, www.charitiesnys.com. And if they're not registered um, in our, with our office, then that's a red flag. Um, so again, you know, um, I just wanna open up for any questions to just let you know that we're here. Uh, this is our website again, and this is our 1-800 number, 1-800, Seven seven one seven seven five five, and thank you again for letting me share. And thank you for that presentation. With that being said, we'd like to open up the floor to the board members for any questions. I hi, good afternoon. Would you mind? This is Joe from Community Board Seventeen. Would you mind sharing that number again, please? Sure, it's one eight hundred seven seven one seven seven five five. And then our office. Thank you very much. Our office number is also 718-560-40. Thank you very much. Do we uh, have yes. any questions? Yeah. Yes. Good afternoon. How are you, Serena? This is uh, Melinda Perkins, CB5. Um, I have a question. In CB5, we had a very serious issue with um, like really aggressive solicitation and harassment of our homeowners, in particular the senior homeowners in the district. And there was a huge campaign towards implementing a cease and desist zone. So I wanted to know from the attorney general side, um, do you help at all with the monitoring of um, those areas once they are? Um, you know, designated as cease and desist zones? Um, I, yes, I, well, I, to, to, to answer your question, yeah, like if, if we receive, if you have any type of complaints of different companies or individuals that are violating certain restrictions, um, you know, uh, contact our office, contact me. Uh, you know, again, I'm Michael Barbosa, uh, and, you know, I can be readily available. I have an email address as well that I could share. Thank you so much. Will do. Wonderful. Um, any other questions from members of the board? I have a question. Ethel Tyus from CD8. Yes. I have a question regarding tenants who are claiming uh, inability to pay rent. Uh, they apply for um, uh, various types of aid, especially unemployment insurance, but then if they don't get a response from the unemployment insurance board, uh, their application for aid is denied and they are not provided any aid and therefore continue not to pay rent. Is there a way to um, separate out those types of applications so that they go through uh, more uh, readily for uh, tenants who owe rent? Um, are unemployed possibly and uh, could pay their rent if they were given unemployment insurance. So, so your question, um, so our, our office is specifically just, um, we don't represent individuals in, in, in any type of tenant landlord disputes. We do have a mediation program, um, but it, it sounds really specific with, with individual tenants. And uh, if there's, you know, some type of, uh, problem dealing with um, access or, or um, you know, not receiving approvals, we're, we're definitely interested in that. Um, but it, it's, it's unclear um, from your question exactly 
what uh, our office would do in a situation that, um, you know, individual tenant is not, um, you know, receiving certain aid and, and, and you know, maybe I'm missing exactly what you're asking our office. The, the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, their level of responsiveness to applications, maybe they're just overburdened, I'm not sure. Okay, but yeah, no, if, 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 if different um, tenants or, you know, New Yorkers are not getting access, yeah, we want to hear about those types of issues. Uh, so, uh, you know, just on the back end, you know, there may be a way uh, for us to, um, you know, we have different advocates that could just see if there's some sort of, you know, systemic problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, is yes. Uh, Teresa Scabo, Community Board Teresa, then um, CB4. Teresa? Okay, simple. Michael, you mentioned your email. Can you share that email or post it in the chat? Sure, sure. Um, I could just put it in the chat with that. I think that'll be easier. Mr. Camacho, CB4. Not, it's not a, a, a question or kind. It's just a, a concern. You know, uh, some of our our, our senior do have one and two uh, family homes. We know uh, you don't represent tenants, and but uh, some of those incidents that are are occurring now, that the tenants is not paying the rent, and the landlords, uh, the seniors that own and lived in the community for a long time, are are are, are having difficulties themselves paying the taxes, the water, and the stuff. How, how does that then for we can continue staying? in the community that uh, we were born and raised in. It, it's kind of getting kind of hard. And there is no representation. Just because you own a home doesn't mean you got money, especially if you own it 50 or 60 years. And and then they got to go out and get a lawyer when this guy is not even paying his rent. So we having a lot of issues with uh, two and three family homes. And these, and then our seniors or our people turn around and sell it. And these scoopers developments knock the two or three family down and create these high rises for a uh, 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 big. What is it that you guys are going to do or try to help to work with the people that had the one or two family home that are barely making ends meet that they're not paying their rent? Um, uh, so, so our office, you know, um, no, absolutely. We, we, we are, <laughs> we represent the people of the entire state of New York. So not just tenants, uh, but also homeowners. And we we partner with an organization called the Home Homeowner Protection Program, which is a, a network of different providers um, on on different types of issues that are affecting homeowners. And as I mentioned, you know, in in terms of uh, you know issues with deed theft, uh, that's definitely an issue that that we we've been recently focusing on as well. I mean, I, I there's also there was also the tax lien. Uh, type of type of advocacy that we were uh, working um, with, you know, other elected officials on as well. Um, let me jump in. Hi, thank you for joining us. This is Deputy Chaplain Ingrid. So thank you for joining us. Hello. We're happy to have you. Um, I think that um, Mr. Camacho was talking about the fact there are a number of people saying um, stop rent. And it's not good for people to believe that it's okay to stop rent for a number of reasons because eventually those people will have to pay rent at some point when the pavement hits the road. If rent is due, you're gonna to have to pay your rent. So it would be good if there was some type of an initiative so people would know that if you really have a rent problem, these are the areas you can go to to get assistance. But if you are just not paying your rent, at some point your landlord will put you in court and you will be evicted. And also it's not good for the landlords because as Mr. Camacho said, some landlords may own a two, three family home. Some may even own a six family home, but that doesn't mean that they're rich. That doesn't mean that they're multimillionaires and they still have to pay their mortgages. So it's bad for everybody. So there needs to be something done on both ends. I think that's what you're talking about, right, Mr. Camacho? And I think that's what we wanted to hear about that. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you. I did, you, 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 said it, you said it better than I did. No, no, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. I'm not the policy. I'm just enforcement on what the law is. And if you go to our website in terms of what tenants rights are, uh, you know, and how people have to claim a hardship, there's sp really specific ways that you can do it. And also the eviction moratorium does not um, excuse the rent. 
it just it just prevents a possessory judgment during this pandemic period. But uh, you know, individuals are still responsible for the monetary judgment. Um, you know, for that. Yeah, and I, and I and I know that, and I know that um, the attorney general is not by any means telling people not to pay their rent. But I'm saying that maybe there's something that could be done if we could put our heads together so that people understand exactly what you just said. So people don't understand that. And, no, what absolutely. and what's yeah. happening is that a lot of people are falling into that trap, but some of the people that are putting them into that trap are people that know these people are going to be evicted and then I'm going to get other people to move in. Mm -hmm. So in the same yeah. regard. And then some people may actually lose their homes. So then yeah. for short sales. So it's really bad. So there has to be something done. I think we just want to bring that to the AG's attention so that maybe she can come up with some way because she's been doing some really good creative things. So no, that's send, send send this information our way, you know, uh, you know, to do a specific uh, presentation. We have our homeowner protection unit that will outline the specific uh, protections and non protections and how, you know, people can be evicted eventually. Just not now, um, if if they don't receive you know certain assistance and they you know have an opportunity to go to court and you know protect you know every, our our main thing is to, to try to protect people's rights, uh, you know during this all the time, but in particular during this uh, pandemic period. And, and also and also uh, the, the 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 two and three family homes that people that have been living here 50, 60, 70 years that 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 are barely making it now. Those are the ones that are making the community more family oriented. We don't mind you building new, but if you don't put us in the process and make us live in some of these homes, then I think uh, it's the opposite way of, uh, of of helping us. We really need a. Uh, Especially, you have the two and three family homes that are, 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 are that are paying their due fair share, been owned the home for a long time, and now you got this guy that's not paying his rent, and now you're behind on your mortgage, and you're gonna lose your house. So guess what? Before I lose my house, I rather said it to these scoopers developments, get my money, run and get out, and then they put a six, seven unit, and now there's no longer affordable housing anymore. It's market rate housing. So that's what we really got to watch and we take away from our community. We got to watch that. We really do, especially in Bushwick that they're doing now. And, and, and in these areas here, we have a lot of those here, and we really need to watch, especially yeah. areas uh, that are two or three family homes that people got these brownstone for so many years, like what's happening in Best Eye. They had it so many years, and their kids are fighting among each other, and the three persons not paying. We got to protect those people that have been here because eventually we lose them, and everybody's going to be a renter, mm -hmm. nobody's going to be a buyer. Because I've been here yeah. since the 60s, and nobody wanted to live in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden, everybody mm -hmm. wants to come in. Thank you for your comments, Mitchell Camacho. Thank you so much. Um, but do we have any before? Did I cut you? Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask, are, are there any members of the public that have any questions before we close out this item? Okay. So in the interest of time, I'd like to thank Mr. Michael um, Barbosa, uh, Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Brooklyn Queens Regional Office for attending tonight, presenting on behalf of the um, New York State Attorney General, Letitia James. Thank you for that presentation. Um, once again, um, he provided his contact number and email was on the presentation, correct? Um, so we do make sure, we wanna make sure the board members make use of, make use of the resources. Thank, and I also like to thank Daryl White for coordinating from the AG2 office too as well. <laughs> I know he was also on the line. So thank you for making it happen. Uh, with that being said, we are going to now go back to our first item for this evening. And that is going to be, because I believe we have a robust atten attendance tonight. And um, so we're going to try to roll through the roll call. All right. Um, Hercules. Reed, Hercules, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. All right. And with that being said, I am going to have Hercules Reed from our office um, just call the rolls. Are you going to start with community boards or council officers? Community? I'll go with community boards first. All right. Uh, at this time, um, we do ask that if you're not on mute, unmute yourselves, so make yourself present and known, and then make sure that your background noise is limited. Thank you. 
Okay, um, community board one. Present. Community board two. Community board three. Here. Community board four. Presente. Community board five. Present. Hi, Alice Loman. Alice, Alice, and Alice Loman, first vice. Sorry, say that again for CB5. Someone... Alice Loman, Alice Loman, the first vice of Community Board 5, and the district manager, Melinda Perkins. Okay, thank you. Community Board 6. <laughs> Community Board 7. Community Board 8. Ethel Tyus on for Community Board 8. Chair. How you doing? Find yourself. Good, good. Community Board 9. Community Board 10. Present, Josephine Beckman. Community Board 11. Community Board 12. Community Board 13. Here. Uh, and also, uh, first vice chair Jeffrey Sandoff and second vice chair Zarina Ahmed. Okay. Community board 14. Gail Smith, CB 14, first vice chair. What are you doing? Uh, community board 15. Teresa Scavo, present. Community board 16. Janice Morgan, present. Community board 17. Joan Alexander Bachredin, present. You doing, Joan? Community Board 18. Good, how are you? CB 18, okay. Uh, we're going over to the council members. We have Council Member Stephen Levin. Councilman Antonio Reynoso. Councilwoman Lori Cumbo. Council Member Robert Cornegy. Ian Fullerton from Council Member Cornegie's office, present. Thank you. Council Member D D um, Woman Dharma Diaz. Elise Rivera here for Council Woman Dharma Diaz. Thank you. Carlos Menchaca, Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Nguyen for Council Member Carlos Menchaca, present. Thank you. Council Member Brad Lander. Fazio Saliki, present for Lander. Council Member Matthew Jean. Councilwoman Alika Samuel. Kim Robinson for Councilmember Alika and Pri Samuel. Thank you. Councilwoman Inez Barron. Councilman Justin Brennan. Present. From what office, Sheldon? From Councilman Brennan's office. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, Councilman Yeager. Councilwoman Farrah Lewis. Councilman Alan Maisel. Uh, Jonathan Aline representing Councilman Alan Maisel. How you doing, Jonathan? I'm all right. Uh, Councilman Mark Traeger. And Councilman Heim Deutsch. Gibran present from Councilmember Heim Deutsch. All right. Um, do we have any others, anyone else that was missed, that was named, was not called? We'll give Michelle and Hercules a minute just to confirm the tally. That's vote 19 and voting members. And present. Borough President's Office, if the no. WDP is not on present. <laughs> That's 20 voting members present. Thank you, wonderful. Um, so uh, we'd like to adapt the minutes from January the 5th for our boards. Copy of the minutes were sent to members in advance. Does anyone have any corrections to the minutes? I know someone noted in the chat. Jonathan? Yes, uh, Jonathan representing Councilman Mizell. Uh, I was here at the last meeting in January, but I checked the minutes and I wasn't counted on the attendance. Okay, thank you for the correction. Thank you. Any other corrections to the minutes? Um, is there a motion to Joan Bacardine moves? Joan Alexander Bacardine moves. 
to accept the, the I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I continue. Joan Bacardine makes moves to accept the the minutes with the one adjustment made by Jonathan Aline in response to his attendance. And Teresa Scavo seconds that motion. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Any members that abstain? With that being said, the motion to accept the minutes from January 5th has passed. Thank you. That concludes our business regarding um, minutes from January the 5th. We'll now move to our final um, agenda item on the meeting. So we have a presentation from the, let me see, from the mayor's office. Uh, the presentation is actually a briefing. It's on police reform and reinvention collaborative. Um, so, so just for some background, I know many of the board members uh, around last year have signed on to a letter that the BPS sent out regarding um, uh, policing and community having a role and having a say. Um, so this presentation uh, has uh, it has that in, incorporated um, in this presentation coming up. Um, so we want to thank the board members who did sign on, the community board members who did sign on to that to that to that letter, um, and hopefully you guys see you know the result of your work. Uh, change and, and impact in government. So we have representative from the mayor's office from the criminal from criminal justice reform from criminal justice. We have representative from intergovernment for intergovernmental affairs. We also have a representative from community affairs and the NYPD. So they'll share an overview of the CD process, right, and procedures to date. They're also seeking input and comments um, from your community boards. So you representing community boards. Please make sure you provide them comments, um, questions, and concerns after their presentation. Um, I am going to make sure that we get Ariana at, at Chaplin, at Kaplan, Senior Advisor for Intergovernmental and Partnership. I see you there. <laughs> um, with her, she has Chelsea Davis, Chief Tragedist Officer and First Deputy Mayor. She also have uh, Leticia. Michael, Senior Advisor for Intergovernmental Affairs and Public Protection. Jamila Fine Pringle, Assistant Commissioner for Community Affairs Unit. Hi, Stella. Um, we have Michael Clark, NYPD Legal Division. Um, we have Jeremy Grimm, City Legislative Affair. And Thomas Giovanni, um, New York City Law Department. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, um, Ariana. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody for taking some time with us. Um, we're going to walk you through a bit of our briefing to talk about the Executive Order 203 and some of the work we've done to date, as well as some of the reforms that we've already announced um, and some of the forthcoming process over the next um, weeks and months. Uh, before I do that, just we had some slight changes to who's here with me, so I just want to make some corrections. I apologize um, for some of these last minute changes. So, um, Deanna Logan, who is our our acting general counsel at the mayor's office for criminal justice is with us mm -hmm. here today and um, I and I believe it's Michael Clark who is here with us from the NYPD um, he is the supervising attorney um, from the legislative bureau um, and then Thomas Giovanni is going to do our our lead of our presentation so I'm going to turn it over to him he'll he'll introduce himself um, I apologize colleagues if I missed anybody um, scrolling through the slides but I think that's the majority of our team um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can all see see the presentation um, please do let me if, know if there's any issues with that all right well good good afternoon everybody and uh, thank you all for coming and we're looking forward to giving you this Presentation. My name, as Ariana said, is Thomas Giovanni. I'm consulting with the first deputy mayor uh, on the reforming the reinvention collaborative. Uh, my background is in uh, criminal justice and, and social justice uh, work focused on racial justice. I was a public defender to start my career at the Neighborhood Defender Service in Harlem and then also uh, worked at the Brennan Center for Justice as well as legal aid uh, before coming to the uh, New York City Law Department to work on the Floyd and the uh, Department of Corrections monitorship. Uh, so I, I have some good background in this uh, in these issues and, and uh, why we need to, to move forward so so much. So I want to just take a few moments to walk you through the outlines of the plan uh, and the executive order, 
uh, and then to, to open up uh, for some questions. But uh, one of the things that we are going to talk about is the ongoing nature of this entire project. Uh, this is not the last opportunity uh, for, for questions or for input uh, to this process. So uh, with that, uh, let's just move forward. Also, oh, I do want to say if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, just go ahead and raise your hand or interrupt, and, and then we'll take them from there. OK. Uh, so this is the agenda. And let me talk to you a little bit about the executive order. It's uh, Executive Order 203. It's uh, from the governor's office. Uh, it was uh, written pursuant to the, uh, to the unrest over the summer. Uh, and it gives us uh, a couple of uh, guidances in terms of its requirements and its purposes uh, that we're trying to satisfy, satisfy. So the overall purpose is to reform local law enforcement policies and strategies uh, so that we mitigate the police-involved deaths and racially biased uh, incidents of law enforcement. Uh, it gives us a process uh, that told us that the city must involve community uh, members and consult stakeholders. We've got to offer the plan for public comment, which will be coming up soon, uh, and then present the plan uh, to the local legislative body, our city council, in this case, uh, for ratification and then being sent to Albany. Uh, and the date for that uh, final uh, ratification is April 1st of this year. Uh, and the, the executive order also directed us uh, in terms of how we could go about uh, forming the plan, which was to review a wide variety of issues that are related uh, to those law enforcement issues, including use of force, procedural justice, uh, looking at systemic racial bias or racial justice issues, uh, including looking at the sort of justice practices and, and their hope for uh, uh, outcomes, and also, of course, the overall uh, goal of law enforcement, which is crime prevention. Uh, as I said, the reform efforts are ongoing. Uh, we uh, inherited a set of issues, and we also have uh, a set of issues that we've identified and are, are working on. But as, as people will, will know, these issues are longstanding, uh, and we plan on uh, committing ourselves to the long term to try and, and keep affecting them. So here's our, our timeline as, as where we are. And the community and stakeholder engagement where we were gathering uh, a lot of the data uh, from various uh, community uh, and various community groups uh, was October through January. Uh, we just are really finishing that process, finish that process now. Uh, the draft plan should be posted soon uh, for the 30 days uh, public comment period, sometimes in February. Uh, final plan drafting uh, with people's comments and, and uh, different feedback will be from February to March, and then the plan will be ratified uh, by the council uh, no later than April 1st of 2021. That's the, that's the timeline there. So the structure that the uh, mayor directed us to, to uh, use was a process led by the first deputy mayor, uh, Dean Fulahan. Uh, it includes uh, city hall members, uh, city hall uh, personnel, some community fairs, Inigov, uh, and the council's office, of course. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, who you have uh, people on the call now, uh, NYPD, uh, the Mayor's Office of Operations, and various city, city council staff, uh, as well as outreach to uh, some state lawmakers as well. We, we've had some contact as well. Um, specifically, in, in trying to uh, make sure that the voices of various communities uh, were not unheard uh, during the process, uh, the NYPD retained uh, Jennifer Jones Austin, Arbor Rice, and Wes Moore. Uh, to help collaborate uh, some of the meetings and also to participate in helping the, the planning go forward. So that is uh, the co-sponsors from those two. And as I said, uh, the engagement is ongoing, uh, in, including a, a very real commitment to what we hope will be an iterative process. Uh, as, as has already been uh, mentioned before, some of your feedback has already been incorporated into current activities uh, from, the, from these meetings. And so we, we uh, intend to continue to demonstrate that that type of responsiveness, uh, and we we hope to develop a framework and, and our specific policy plans will include moments for stakeholders and moments for others uh, to give feedback and comment before plans are, are actually executed in impacted communities. And the goals of that engagement uh, and, and what we what we hope to have uh, community members see and feel uh, is that these policies affect and reflect the perspectives of the, mo of the most heavily policed communities, not, the, not those communities that have not uh, had that to bear that weight. Uh, and that we receive policy proposals from those community members and from uh, experts in the field so that we can develop our ideas for building trust and legitimacy uh, through using evidence-based processes. And what we want to do is establish a long-term uh, set of structures that will allow us to 
continue to get engagement, and continue to get information in ways that we, we have uh, lacked before, and, and that can contribute to the problem. Uh, so what have we done? Uh, as I said, we focus, and the executive order directs us to focus on the most highly impacted communities. Uh, we've talked to youth uh, groups, reform advocates of particular uh, types of uh, areas, uh, community-based organizations, uh, faith-based organizations, uh, including pure violence, uh, various uh, religious faith, uh, oversight agencies, the CCRB, uh, the Department of, of, of Investigation, uh, also the uh, Committee uh, for Public Corrupt Against Public Corruption, Police Corruption, sorry, uh, and various elected officials, uh, some of whom are represented here. Uh, we've had more than 60 uh, total meetings, uh, over 100 organizations represented. Uh, we've had 15 virtual meetings, uh, or, or, or a little more, I think, uh, but uh, directed towards uh, moder uh, listening sessions and the like. Uh, the other page, again, has the same uh, uh, continued listening. Uh, importantly, we also met with uh, members of the police force themselves. Obviously, uh, some of this reform uh, has to be uh, undertaken with them in mind, obviously. And so uh, there's a lot of feedback that they were uh, they gave as well, uh, as, as well as roundtable meetings, 40 roundtable meetings with various uh, policy experts, community leaders, and different members of service. Um, and I should say uh, about this list, among other things, uh, there will be a website going up uh, relatively soon uh, that's going to have this kind of summary information on it. And so you'll be able to track and see what we've done and what we're continuing to do in regard to this. Uh, it's not quite online yet, but we are we're nearing uh, finality and, and should be getting it up soon. Uh, okay, and then again, to somewhat restate uh, the goals because we, we, we want to make sure that we're clear about how, how we're going about uh, trying to solve the problem. One of the, the, the major goal, and it is very clearly spelled out in the executive order, is that we need to eliminate racially biased policing and, and any instances of unnecessary or excessive force. Uh, it is uh, on, uh, on us to try to apply principles of restorative justice and reconciliation uh, in order to increase uh, police. Uh, police uh, civilian trust between each other. Uh, we want to address areas of police culture that may act as impediments, that do act as impediments to the achievement of reform goals. There are aspects of that culture we have to, to address. And we want to create evidence-based policy reform and permanent structures to achieve and support those goals. And so we have a general framework uh, that, we, that we developed pretty early on based on uh, our own experience as well as the immediate feedback we received that let us know what our top level of issues and, and, and what our approach ought to be in terms of subject matter. Um, it's probably no surprise, discipline was top of the list, uh, accountability, transparency, improve, improving police and civilian interaction, uh, the specific role of the police, which is our uh, phrasing for what a lot of people talk about in terms of the right side and defunding, uh, seeing whether or not uh, the police are in the right role or in the wrong role uh, for various types of service, including homeless, mental health, and the like. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the police department itself. Um, it, it definitely is no secret to anybody that uh, there should be more uh, diversity and leadership at the uh, NYPD to reflect more uh, the communities that they, that they police. And then the most general areas, and this is again from both feedback and, and professional experience, uh, culture and training issues that need to be uh, addressed and resolved in order to go forward on these issues. So that was the general framework that we were given and, and we, we developed to move forward. Within each one of those topics, there are uh, a number of reforms that people have put forward, hundreds in certain cases, uh, that people put forward that we're collating and, and putting into, uh, uh, into our, our report. Uh, and some of them will make it into the initial report, some of them may be part of longer work. And so here are uh, some of the reforms that the, the mayor has already announced. Uh, you may have heard about these. Uh, including the disciplinary matrix and the uh, memorandum of understanding between CCRB and NYPD, uh, agreeing to, to use the uh, disciplinary guidelines for misconduct uh, cases. Uh, that should help, uh, and it certainly will bring some more uh, transparency to the process. Uh, what they call the David Jenkins plan for strengthening the CCRB, uh, giving them greater access to uh, information, giving them uh, direct access uh, to some of the information they need. Uh, to uh, initiate individual investigations, uh, giving them full access to officer history uh, and the authority to investigate uh, bias-based police and complaints. Uh, also to establish a patrol guide review committee 
to help drive forward other policy changes that may not be uh, caught in the actual uh, trying and, and determining of a, a specific violation. Uh, another thing is to expand the CCRB to include uh, the Department of Investigation and Commission for Police Corruption uh, in, in some consolidated body uh, to, to strengthen its ability to exercise oversight functions. Uh, more uh, that have been done in joint force to in gun violence, which is a multi-agency task force uh, that they're going to uh, um, to use to focus on uh, those, those small groups of people that cause a disproportionate amount of, uh, of harm in these areas, uh, including contact tracing and, and citywide shooting reviews. Uh, they're going to more than uh, to at least double the cure violence workforce. Um, that is probably one of the, the most uh, smart bang for your buck type uh, activities we can engage in. Cure violence providers have been uh, great over the years. Uh, we're going to give communities a direct role in the selection and evaluation of uh, precinct commanders. You've heard about that, uh, I imagine. And putting uh, the community uh, into uh, CompStat, elevating community feedback to a, 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 a set of uh, data and, and concerns that they bring into CompStat, uh, which, which will elevate the attention those issues get. Uh, embedding community engagement more into the training by expanding the People's Academy and also uh, giving new officers uh, deeper acculturation. Uh, type training when it comes to the precinct. Uh, one of the things that uh, many, many community members said uh, was that they did not know uh, their officers and their officers did not know them. Uh, hopefully this, this type of uh, engagement will help that. So how did we get feedback, uh, community and stakeholder recommendations, uh, and how we will take feedback. Now we take feedback during uh, sessions such as these. You can email us. This is the, the email there. Uh, we also uh, will have a period of public comment once the plan is posted for 30 days. All comments will be reviewed, uh, just as with, with any, uh, any legislation, and we will uh, take them very seriously. Uh, as I said before, we've already adopted some ideas that people have, have proposed to us, including the precinct commander selection. Uh, and then, as I said, the, the website and the online portal, uh, portal will be available soon. So is that our last? Okay. So that that is the outline of the plan. Um, and if uh, there are questions, I certainly, uh, I and the team are here to take them. Uh, if you have questions later, I and the team will be here to take them. I have a question. Ethel ties with CBA. So we, yeah, we go open the floor for questions from the board members. Go ahead. Well, is it possible to get a copy of this presentation to share with the Public Safety Committee? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, this is Joan Alexander Bakardin from Community Work 17. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It's quite informative. In regards to the reforms that have already been announced, uh, for example, the giving the community a direct role in selecting and evaluating the, pre the precinct commanders, putting mm -hmm. the community in ComStat, doubling the cure violence workforce. What is the timeline for implementation? There are different timelines, and, and I don't have all the information, for instance, because of the budget implication, we're going to have to hire and, and find the staff for instance, mm. for the cure violence providers. That's a different issue. Uh, but in terms of the precinct commander, uh, those policies are already underway. I don't know whether the, where the next vacancy happens to be, but at the, the rule is to be effective as of now. And, and that process should be happening when, whenever there's another. And do you already have a plan in place for let's say it was the 7 precinct that it was the next in line is there already a, a process established for what that that interview or that what that workflow would look like i can't i don't i don't actually know uh, that would be something for a more operational level for for the offices i know that they're working on their policies i don't know if it's what developed at this second i do know again that it is the plan to be effective now but I don't know the specifics in terms of which, which, which who's next. Um, hi, this is uh, Gail Smith, CB14. I too want to thank you uh, for the presentation. It was very um, helpful. I know that most of us um, that are on this call were played a role in some um, fashion through the borough president's office in giving mm -hmm. our recommendations. So. Um, knowing more, um, get to know more about 
what you have implemented in reference to what the uh, previous, my previous uh, colleague asked would be very helpful so that we know because we will yeah. be having community board meetings. In fact, I'm having one on Monday and I would just like to give them a little bit of information. Okay. Um, yeah, Thomas, oh, go ahead. I'm happy to. Um, so I, I think we can oh, yeah, we I can commit to coming back to you and, and sharing. Uh, we will commit to sharing with you as much as we're we're able um, prior to Monday. Uh, you know, it was just announced uh, just a few days ago, so we'll give you what detail we know exactly on the timeline, and we're happy to at minimum share with you the details of that announcement that the mayor made alongside the borough president, so that so that you have that material at minimum to share. But I think you all know Jamila, and so we'll make sure she's also you know a nice source of information and constant contact for you and we'll we'll get you as much as we can and that goes for any of the the questions that are to come um any substantive material as it's developed we'll make sure we disseminate as as much as we can the website will be lop, uh, uh, launched quite soon as well and much of this will also be become public on that website as well all right, just uh, a point of uh, information we will though be uh, receiving the presentation that Mr. Giovanni provided because it was very uh, helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We'll yeah. we'll share that. Yep. All right. Thank you. And, I'm sorry. And will you all share that for, to everyone? The the yes. insight as to where we are by Monday, and then of course the the presentation. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I waited for that. Yes. We'll give you a uh, make sure I have copy. Yes, I realize many of you are um, on audio, so I shouldn't nod. So yes, we will um, we'll work through Jamela, but we'll get you everything, um, and it can be disseminated through the um, borough president's office and um, Jamela. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15. I just want clarification on the answer Thomas gave. It is already in effect. The order, is, as I understand the order, it was issued on that on the, the next precinct commanders that are already chosen uh, should have that process go forward with them. Whatever, the, I, and I don't know the details of the process yet, but the order was supposed is, is as I understand, effective as of now. As of what day? The, the day that the uh, uh, that the commissioner said. I, I don't remember the, whether it was three days ago or two days ago. I, I'm sorry. Oh, and but it's within the last week. You know, when, when, when it was announced. And okay, thank you. We'll get you the specifics as well. Yeah, I apologize for not having a date. Thank you, Fat. Any other questions from the board members? I, I could, if I may just add, you know, we really value your input on what we're sharing and other reforms that you think are priorities. Um, we're here today, you know, after having um, talked to the borough president's office, because we we want to take as much information from all of you on what um, your priorities are in this process. So please don't be shy of sharing that. If you prefer to email us or you prefer to wait until the 30 day comment period, we respect that fully. But if someone has a comment, uh, we're here today because we really want to hear your voices and, and hear what your priorities are during this process. Um, there you have in uh, especially um, Thomas and Deanna, um, Latia, Jamela, and I think Marcos is also on the line. You have a lot of the team that are really leading this effort. And so um, they're they're the ones that are that are being malleable every day to take in information and figure out where the priorities are from all of our constituents. So please don't be shy to share comments with us in addition to questions. Hmm. So, so hi, I'm Camacho from CB4 uh, Bushwick. So, so when when there's an opening available, then how would the procedure go? How would the community know? Uh, would would the precinct council, with the community boards, who 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 implements that there is a, a, an opening there? How do we know one? And how are they bringing the information before they even? Uh, uh, even uh, put someone in there, or rec we recommend someone in there. How, how do they bring the information back? 
I'm going to defer to my NYPD uh, colleagues on this, and I, I'm not sure if, they, if we have the operational detail right now, but I know that you can make sure that you are, are connected with both your local and the uh, uh, PD uh, main resource for information about how they're going to actually roll that out and where, the, and where that comes. Uh, certainly, I would expect your precinct commanders uh, to, to be reaching out as those things, your existing ones, to be reaching out as those processes are going on. But I do want to make sure we just connect you with the PD resources that are appropriate for that uh, question uh, just offline. We'll make sure that um, whether it's Jamila or Ariana or me, that we, we yeah. make sure you get the, the right people to ask and then they can tell you as things develop. So, and so, I, and this is Mike from NYPD. I, I, I don't have exactly everything on this, but what I understand, and it'll be when there's a, uh, a, a vacancy or a planned vacancy, um, the police commissioner will submit three to five names to be interviewed by uh, the precinct council who will interview the candidates and provide feedback to the police commissioner. Um, but like, the exact details, I still, I, I, you know, I, I think there's more detail than that. I just wanted like as a broad overview of, of how it would work. And Mr. Camacho, I'll get, I'll circle back around with you and share whatever um, details I get too. Yeah, because uh, I remember we signed, yeah, we signed the, we signed the letter uh, the community boards also wanted to be because that's exactly uh, what we signed when we signed the executive order so i don't know how we got excluded out of that uh, uh i know that now it went to the to the a3 uh to the precinct councils i want to make sure that uh, the community at large uh uh, also, uh, because we signed on, off on that uh, executive order with the borough president, so maybe we can uh, 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 find out uh, what happened uh, with that. If they excluded us, or did they add us, or uh, uh, I, I don't know what happened to that. Because we signed the executive order in regards that we wanted the community boards and the uh, the precinct council. Because I think I still have a copy of that. Uh, uh, ex uh, uh, Thing that we signed so i don't know what what they do who, who eliminated us why they put or um it's someone from the for your comment so um so thank you for sharing that for the i'll try to see if i could pull up the original letter correspondence that was sent I have, over I have the copy here that's why i'm saying i know for yeah. the fact that we implemented that ourselves uh also ingrid uh, knows that because i signed off on that uh specifically i just i'm just uh, a little concerned how did the process play that they eliminated uh and only created the uh, St. councils so I i'm just concerned so, so, about that thank you yeah so I i'll get more information uh back to you about the exactly how the process will work i i I, I don't know for the exact makeup. I just know it'll be, you know, submitting three to five uh, candidates, but I'll, I'll get back to you on, on, on the exact makeup of, you know, the process. I, I apologize about that. But wasn't it and regards to the makeup? It was, oh. a, is it, is it, is it regards of the eliminations that we submitted in regards to executive order? That what we wanted was the community board to have stakes in some of the, uh, uh, and the precinct council and now we got eliminated out of that process when we started with the borough president and now it's only the 83 precinct council so i need some clarification on what deals that they made to eliminate us out of that process and just for uh just for a comment so the comments from this evening i believe you guys the mayor's office is going to take the comments back right so the feedback back and as you guys said, it's going to take a process. So some things are going to be implemented, and some things are probably have to come back to be maybe adjusted. Um, I, I don't want to speak out of terms, but the comments that you guys are providing tonight, they're going to probably sort of take that back, correct? Absolutely, we're taking the so, comments. Yeah, so um, it's duly noted. Um, that's why we want to make sure you guys share your, uh, express your opinions, your feedback from the community now um, during this particular time. And so, then there will be the public it may be, uh, maybe a component that you may have seen that may have been missed or may not have been um, put on the presentation, but um, you know, we'd like to have your voices heard now. But and also, I don't want to. I don't want to overpromise. Uh, no, no, we don't, and we don't want to. And and just to be clear, this is not a matter of um, once again overpromising things. Say things are going to change, but we want to make sure that you guys just they note the concerns and then they'll be handled a, a, accordingly. So okay, yeah. Just, we, so we've, we've literally gotten thousands of, of suggestions. The plan is not going to be for thousands of plans. 
I'm sorry, who's speaking? I'm sorry, because it was like, that I, was I, Thomas. I was, that was Thomas. Thomas, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas, for- But, but I do want to add to that, that like, we're in this process right now because we really want real change to happen. So I do know that, like, this is not to just be, you know, blowing smoke and mirrors. Absolutely. That's why you already seen some of your work and you will continue to see. I just don't want to make it sound as if, you know, everything is going to get done exactly the way everybody wants. I don't want to come in here and sell that. No. And I, I appreciate that. And we want to do that too as, as well. We want to make sure that we're transparent and we're accurate with the words that we kind of state during these, this meeting. Yep. Um, any other questions? Concerns, can, questions, Rick? Hi, good evening. Uh, Melinda Perkins again, CB5. I just wanted, um, if this is a point that can really be taken back and and I think, you know, most of our boards across the city would feel the same. Um, you know, community boards have such, you know, we play such a huge role in how our districts are receiving services. And one of the most important things is our quality of life and public safety. So, you know, we understand that there's the amount of input is always going to be limited. But when you remove a community board and the voice of the community board, even at the very minimal level of just having the executive board provide input, not it doesn't necessarily have to be all 50 members but the executive board could be the representation for the community board and thus a real voice for the community um you know we have to remember that we cannot continue to remove community board voices from city agency policies because it, it happens far too often but we are the the body um that's always um, presented to, and we're we're encouraged to continue um, to, you know, stand up for community and and hold our offices down. But you know, the bottom line is we cannot continue to be removed. Our voices are very important to the process, and the the precinct council um, committees, of course, are are just as important. But we have to remember, community boards play a major role in this city. Gail Smith, okay. CB14, um, I, I think that all of us echo that sentiment and that's why you, so many questions are being asked because I think we were basic, basically taken aback in the sense that we weren't aware of all that had been done um, and we had been a part of the, the process initially as community boards and would love to continue to, to do so. Yeah, thank you for that. And and I think um, what we're going to ask of all of you um, after you know, we finish today's conversation is um, please do. We, we are here because we value your input and the role you play in your communities. So we really would ask that you submit comments, that you share the presentation with your community boards and ask them to submit comment. Um, you know, those those venues for us to take that that material and and have it shared with us is exactly what we're we're looking for. So please use that email and those the online portals. There'll be opportunity for additional discussion. Um, contact Jamila. We're you know we're of course talking to the members of the the legislature and the borough presidents. But please 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 share commentary. That's that's exactly what we're looking for. And um, Melinda, I did want to say that I think everything that you brought up was a community board should not be forgotten in any of the process and that we're definitely going to be bringing up what you mentioned today and what um, Kamacha did mention today at the table. Make sure that people are informed about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, because all, all we wanted, all I want to know is how, how we got eliminated out of the process and we were one of the forefronts that stand on it. I still have a copy of the letter now that I'm seeing, and it's it's, it's kind of disheartening that uh, uh that they just uh, pushed us to the side like somebody's stepchild. And we really need to address some of these issues. We will need to uh, speak to the borough president, find out uh, what happened uh, uh, with us signing that petition and indicating and working and putting the us in the forefront all of a sudden to be at the sideline. So mm -hmm. I just want uh, uh, I'll speak with the borough president myself and find out what happened that uh, this board, uh, uh, this uh, 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 a borough a board uh, was eliminated out of that process or not eliminated or not added on to. Yeah, I'll find it. Oh, thank you Hello, for the all comment, the specifics. So, just yeah. if you're speaking, just state your board and your name, even though you're coming back again, just for the record. 
And Kamachi, your comments are noted for the record. So we have we have that firm and doing it. Thank, thank you. And, and, and let Ingram know, please, because we 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 fought for that ourselves and we want to make sure that we, we stick to what all the boards that signed off on me. Yeah, yeah. And Serrano, so just scale Smith again, just please make sure we get the uh, the presentation as soon as possible. Um, many of us, in fact, um, community board 14 is having our board meeting on Monday. So I would like to be able to digest everything and report out on it. In process, will do. Um, do we have any other comments, concerns from the board and also members of the public who is yeah, joining us? Community board three. CB3. Yeah. Um, I just um off the last conversation, I think it's also important that um for the community engagement piece that there's some sort of like backup that's provided on the type of outreach that's made to include community members once community groups are participating in the interview process. I think that you know if if it's precinct councils or community boards or both, I think that we also have a responsibility to be accountable to the communities we serve to ensure that we're actually reaching out to community members to ensure that they know that this process is open and there's scrutiny being happening on the hiring end. So I think that whatever we whatever is decided, it needs to include some sort of evidence of backup. Like, was there a community announcement made or something that allows the public to be fully engaged? Yes, those kind of comments are very well taken and that's, that's a good point for for any uh, decent process that they're going to stand up. Uh, I, I know Michael has said that he's going to make sure that we get you all are connected with the right people at PD to, to have the right, uh, right communication on that. Okay. And once again, the floor is open up to members and also members of the public who would like to make a comment before we wrap up on this item. Okay. Nice. So it seems wonderful. So, we have no more questions, concerns, or comments. Well, we have concerns, <laughs> but we have any more comments or questions at this time. Um, so we'd like to thank the mayor's team, um, uh, Thomas, Jamila, um, Ariana, for uh, coming out and presenting tonight. Just hold on one second. And that will kind of conclude. Any final words from the mayor's office, from the NYPD before? No, thank you very much. Thank okay. you all for hearing us. Um, and, and please remember this. Ms. Mitchell. <laughs> we'll be okay. We'll wonderful. Be uh, and we'll keep going. Thank you so much. That concludes our business um, with the mayor's office regarding the reintervention um, collective on um, police reform. Thank you for joining us. We're going to try to wrap up this meeting and just move it on to any new business for members. And Jamila, thank you for attending too as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Do we have any new business? Nope. Okay. Do we have any unfinished business for the members of the board? No, we got. Just one more announcement once again. Um, community board applications, February 12th. Uh, make sure you guys um, have your members get the application in. Please connect with your li liaisons directly. Um, they have been in communications trying to get attendance sheets and answer any questions that you may have. Um, for council members, if you have direct questions, you know, reach out to me and just try to set up like a probably like a call or a meeting in regards to any questions you may have in regards to your membership list or sheets. Um, so we want to make sure we, the process is timely this year and we execute flawlessly. Um, with that being said, uh, motion yes, to adjourn. Joan Lockerdine seconds it. Joan seconds. Thank you guys. So <laughs> next meeting will be on March the 2nd. Please note we're looking to have Department of City Planning back again and also possibly uh, a budget um, here in two as well. Thank you guys for attending. Stay safe and warm and um, have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you too. Take good care, everyone. Good night, good night everybody. Good night. Uh, Hercules, for the record, please note that Councilmember Lewis' office is on the meeting. Just one yes, minute. I got her. Okay.
Okay. David, I'm copying my own chat, so I got it. <laughs> ah, you did an awesome job. I got it. I got copy. I have the chat, so let me copy and paste it off the buggy. Perfect. I'm also going to send you a, a formal copy of the chat anyway. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Until next month, David. Thank you. See you later. See you later.